in Africa. We have okay. we have team in not only Kenya, but in in Nigeria, in Egypt, in Seychelles, in Senegal, uh, and we hope to add a couple more countries next year. So we're very uh, our, our default is to try to find local talent uh, to fin- fill these jobs, and specifically, I think a lot of um, um, our clients are broadly in the social impact sector. So okay. they're 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 working on um, um, trying to to bring new solutions to markets, drive new programs around the SDGs do something good in the world. So I think where we're hunting for talent is for people that are from more mainstream careers, mainstream industries, traditional corporate settings, who often will have some experience and skills um, that they've developed. And then yeah. what we're doing is trying to say, hey, how about you get them you take those skills and you, into you can that. bring them over here. Interesting. Um, yeah. And um, and, I, and I think that's that's really rewarding for us because it 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 gives us this kind of direct to do SMEs, but but very critically help more SMEs leap make cross that chasm into actually employing people okay i think uh one of the things that happens is we we and it's great this is the, the right first step we create a lot of smes there's a lot of micro entrepreneurs a lot of sole entrepreneurs that are kind of like engaged in livelihood activities what's so critical for jo- and that's that's good but what's really important is for these companies to be able to cross that chasm into having enough revenue, enough business, enough production where they can employ people yeah. and go from, you know, you know, working by themselves or maybe one or two or three employees to a place where they're employing 20, 30, 100 uh, uh, people. And I think that's where yeah. things get exciting for the SME sector. Hi there. Wow. You see, yeah. we have a, a missed each, each other. Yeah. Pardon? I say we have miss, missed each other. You know, we, yeah. have, we should have had this, <laughs> this conversation weeks ago, you know? I know. I know. It's great to finally finally see you and, and yeah. finally do this yeah. right in time for the holidays. Uh, are you going to do anything it's, nice? Well, I'll, I'll try something nice for my kids. Yeah, maybe. Mm-hmm. So Good. you you were in, in, in New York. Okay. Are you going back there for holiday or are you going to have a No. Um, I, we, I'm we i going to go back in January for some meetings, but okay. um, luckily my wife and I will just stay in Kenya. We'll take a few days at the beach um, nice. and then a few days back here and then back to work, but really looking forward to a few, uh, a little bit of time off. It's been, okay. it's been okay. a great year, but a bit, but a very busy year. Mm. How about mm-hmm. for you? That, that, that's, that's, that's interesting. Uh, I like to hear that people have had a great year and busy year. See, I, yeah. I, I had a young man on the, on the podcast and she was telling me, oh, he has been so busy, blah, blah, blah. As if it's a bad thing. I told him, no, you're yeah, busy. That's good. Yeah. yeah busy is good. It's I good. Mean, you don't want to be too busy, but you definitely don't want to be bored exactly. with nothing to do. That's exactly. the worst. Exactly. Wow, Paul. See, let's do this. Uh, I want you to. I I want you to introduce yourself. Tell my audience who you are and what you do. Great. I'll just give you a little bit of context. So, um, um, yes, I'm Paul. I'm the CEO and one of the co-founders of of Shortlist, which Mm -hmm. is a talent advisory firm that's working to solve human capital for companies and organizations that are driving impact and innovation across Africa. So we do a mix of executive search, which does more leadership hiring. And we do, we have a, a, what we consider a workforce innovation lab called Shortlist Futures, where we're designing different kinds of programs or interventions that might enable more young people to find fulfilling careers in some of the growth sectors of the future. So green economy, digital, uh, digital economy, and digital jobs, areas like that. Um, But before this, um, I I spent most of my career focused on different ways that we can make markets and business uh, do good things in the world. And so um, spent uh, several years uh, um, and most of my career in financial inclusion. Um, So started a community development bank uh, that was serving um, local communities in uh, Connecticut when I was in law school. I went to India and worked in microfinance for a few years. And then set up an impact investing fund that was investing in startups that were driving different innovations around inclusive fintech. So fintech, but but ultimately trying to deliver 
uh, life improving uh, products and services to uh, low income households, small businesses, et cetera. Uh, and it was kind of through doing, and then originally, if you go back further, I was briefly a corporate lawyer. I, yeah, I spent okay. some time in advertising. I'm from originally a small town in Western New York state. Um, so from, from, from the U S originally, uh, although I haven't, I haven't lived there very much in the last 15 years. Um, and, uh, um, um, shortlist came about largely because of, um, the, the work, my co-founder no. Simon and so, Paul, yeah, sorry. live, live, live. Just uh, shortlist for for for, 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 for time bit because we talk about it more. Okay, see, you have done several different things. Okay, and uh, you are in Kenya. See, my audience, especially my African audience, would like to know something about how you ended up in uh kenya i mean you just said that you you are from a small town new york so tell us that journey that brought you from that little town new york to kenya yeah i think i think i've always um well i think more i've always been an adventurous person that wants to kind of see and experience things. I was not okay. always a traveler. In fact, I didn't have a passport and didn't leave the country, I think until I was 22. Um, so um, uh, they, I've since then been traveling a lot, but uh, while, you know, in, when, I was, when I was younger, our family trips tended to be more local. I've always yeah. been drawn to trying to um, learn new things, go new places. Um, I think that uh, um, really it's been my career that's taken me here and, and, and elsewhere. Um, I think that what, what gets me excited are, are big, uh, complicated problems that might be able to be addressed with okay. scalable solutions, business models, et cetera. Um, initially, I was enthralled with microfinance, and that brought me to India, and I really loved time in India. Uh, I will say when I moved to India in 2006, I, I really didn't anticipate that I would be there a long time or mm. that... India and eventually, uh, generally, emerging markets would be such a focus for me. But I know that at the time it was it was it was incredibly exciting to be able to not just try all the challenges that come along with building a business, but doing it in in a market that was so big, was so new to me, was what had so many um, learning opportunities around different cultural approaches, different ways of getting things done, um, and and I think. Uh, um, um, while I, I, I in the mean, in the middle of all of this, um, spent several years living in the U.S., I think uh, I, I realized um, being closer to the the kind of uh, projects and businesses and and change I'd like to see yeah. has just been more fulfilling from from a career point of view and from a lifestyle point of view. It's it's almost been easier to find a tribe of amazing people who yeah. care about similar things. Oftentimes I'm back in the U.S. and I love the U.S., I'm American, but you often find Americans that forget there's a, there's a world outside of America. Um, yeah. And I could, that, that could be alienating in its own way. And so I've, I've, I think this merger of, of life and work um, has made it wonderful now to be here. Yeah, yeah. See, emerging markets may be difficult, Okay, because uh, the processes are not embedded, so uh, doing things may be a little bit difficult. But if you are somebody who is uh, adventurous, emerging market is exactly where you want to be, because you can make more impact. Yes, difficulties are are opportunities. You see. When I, I I I moved from Nigeria, in fact, in 06 was my first time to travel through Africa. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, South Africa, Kenya, a little bit, uh, Uganda, and all that. You know, I was working for Citigroup then. And then I now came to the UK. Uh and within a short space of time, I realized that nah, 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 Africa is the place to be. Okay. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to go back. But hey, working with clients, young people in particular in Africa, you know, 
trying to help him guide them through things, it's more exciting to me, you know. And you as uh, an innovator working, trying to solve problems, uh, there are more problems in emerging markets, you know. So yeah, it's 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 exciting. So yeah, uh, and I would say you know yeah. I, I I really do view I mean Af Africa is obviously many countries. It's not one place. It's 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 usually diverse. But I do think the 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 opportunities and the challenges facing um, Africa as a continent and some of the countries within Africa um, are going to be very generation defining and yeah. very important for the next uh, 20, 30, 40 years. Exactly. Um, some 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 scary things in the horizon, <laughs> but boy, so many opportunities um, and so many so many um, 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 assets and uh, you know where where we work around um, talent and human capital and and, and workforce. Yeah, obviously, is just one of many um, pot pot potential huge opportunities um, to capitalize on because there yeah. are so many young people um, coming in with energy and and creativity and talent. Um, at a time when many countries around the world are shrinking and declining, and so yeah. yes, uh, um, it's 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 a it's a continent that presents many many opportunities to plug in, do something, many challenges, uh, but many opportunities. Yes, yes, indeed. Yes. So, tell me a little bit about that venture that you are working on right now. Shortlist. Yeah, so so we started shortlist about eight years ago. Um, initially, we we were pretty naive and we weren't sure what part of the human capital problem we wanted to solve. But we knew that as my co-founder and I, uh, my co-founder co-founders and I, were all doing different things around investing and trying to support um, startups and 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 organizations grow and scale that. You know, while money is definitely a problem and a lot of people focus yeah. on money and fundraising and how do you how do you raise a seed round and all of that, um, there's really less focus on the people side. And the reality is once you raise money, the first problem you have that is defining to whether your business makes it or, or loses is, is, is people. And so we noticed there was not the same focus on that. A lot mm. of companies were struggling with this. It was causing a lot of pain, it was slowing down growth and impact. And we wanted to see what, what we might be able to bring to market to solve that. Initially, Shortlist was much more of a tech company. We built a software platform that was doing assessments and chatbots to try to level the playing field for talent. Um, one of the things we noticed was that not only were companies kind of inundated with CVs, okay. but it was leading to a system that, so it was very inefficient and there was opportunities to automate that. It was also leading to a system where employers were making decisions on people based on things that weren't always the best signals mm. of who was going to be good. So we wanted to get kind of underneath the CV and underneath the privilege of did you get to go to a good school or did you get to work at a good company, possibly just because your parents were well off or okay. had money or something. And instead say, how do we how do we give everyone a chance to show what they can do? Um, um, demonstrate like they have the skills. So we were licensing that to businesses, um, and it was going okay. Uh, but but really, what what businesses and 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 NGOs and social impact organizations kept asking us for was more hands on solution uh, mm. things things that things that looked more service. They were they okay. were kind of like this tech is good, but you know, can you just work with us to try to get to the results we need? And so today, our business has these two two arms. On one hand, we we work. Um, on very senior searches. So typically CEOs, COOs, and kind of one, maybe one level of leadership down below. And it's a very okay. hands-on process. We're very research intensive. We go out, we try to figure out what exactly does this company need? Where might that person live? What jobs might they be in? And then go out and talk to everybody and see who, yeah. who might be a good fit. The other side uh, is is very much focused more on the entry level and early career side of the equation, okay. where we're really targeted on two two separate issues. On one yeah. hand, there's several growth sectors, uh, particularly the green economy and climate and things like that, but several areas where workforce and the availability of a skilled, ready, prepared workforce is holding the sectors back. Okay. And we want to be able to address that pain point and make sure that um, 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 there's people available and ready and excited to go into the, the the jobs and the labor needs as those emerge. On the other hand, there's a lot of um, Africans that are looking for jobs um, and will be even more in the future. Um, I've seen numbers that maybe 500 million people will be added to the workforce in the next 10 years. Okay. 
business as usual in terms of job creation and in, in given kind of like GDP trends and, and macroeconomic trends, saying maybe there will be 100 million jobs created. So you have this major gap of 300, 400 million um, people that will enter the workforce that will need to find um, work. Yeah. And so I think at the same time that we're trying to serve the, 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 the growth opportunity of companies, we're also trying to make sure that uh, um, Africans uh, know uh, what part of youth know what jobs are available, know, know what, um, um, where are going to be the careers of the future, which, yeah. which sectors or jobs might be shrinking, which ones are on the rise that you should hop on that rocket ship, how do you get access to them, what do you need to know? And then we work very hard to try to design apprenticeships and work experiences to actually get people into jobs for their first time to, to get on that career ladder and, and progress from there. So we're very much focused on formal sector career track jobs in sectors that we think can grow and create a lot of jobs in the coming five to 10 years. So green economy, global digital economy, so remote digital work, yeah. um, which a lot of people think software engineering, but there's a lot of other things out there um, across that economy. Yeah. And so different, dif different things that we, uh, that we work on, um, um, to try to make that easier. It's, uh, it's, it's exciting. Uh, <clears throat> now two things, the lower end jobs, uh, we have a lot of people, a lot of young talented people across Africa. Okay. we have that now. When it comes to the C-level roles, where are where is is shortlist focused on getting those talents? Great question. Um, um, where we you, your question implies that maybe we're looking at talent cross border and and, yeah. and expats and. Um, generally not. Um, oh, okay. um, actually, that's that's very rare. It happens occasionally, uh, of course, because because our our commitment to our clients is let us find you the best person and the best people for this job wherever they might be in the world. So that okay. certainly means occasionally we're doing global searches and sourcing talent. I think I think what uh, um, we are I think we are actually the probably the largest executive search firm with uh, in terms of the number of people based. In Africa, we have okay. we have team in not only Kenya but in in Nigeria, in Egypt, in Seychelles, in Senegal, uh, and we hope to add a couple more countries next year. So we're very uh, our, our default is to try to find local talent uh, to fin fill these jobs, and specifically, I think a lot of um, um, our clients are broadly in the social impact sector. So okay. they're 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 working on um, um, trying to to bring new solutions markets drive new programs around the SDGs, do something good in the world. So I think where we're hunting for talent is for people that are from more mainstream careers, mainstream industries, traditional corporate settings, who often will have some experience and skills um, that they've developed. And then yeah. what we're doing is trying to say, hey, how about you get them, you take those skills and you, into you that. bring them over here. Interesting. Um, yeah. And, um, and, I, and I think that's, that's really rewarding for us because it, it, it gives us this kind of direct sense of um, this doesn't this is not always the case of course but um, but but generally as we're able to take more talent which we view as a kind of renewable resource yeah and deploy it from maybe more traditional um, 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 goals and business ventures into into more high impact ones um, we get excited about that good and and, and we've, we've been excited to see there is lots and lots of talent. <laughs> To, to, to draw from. Okay. Um, I think that um, um, one area, the one area that there is a few, of course, technical type positions where um, they're new enough in Africa that, that we haven't had the time for people to kind of grow up through yeah. levels of seniority. And then there's, I think, startups in general, they're, they're, they move so quickly. They're, they need to, you need to be so agile to work. Um, I think uh, um, the startup ecosystems in Africa are, are, are doing well, have been around for, for, for a while, but are still yeah. relatively they're still new. They're still new. Yeah, still, still new in the scheme of, of like, uh, you know, if you think about over the last hundred years or something. And so I think in that area, continuing to find uh, um, talent that uh, is, is getting comfortable uh, in more, in more fast paced, agile, uncertain environments. Mm. Well, the, re re the reason why I ask that question is that, hey, uh, like, I, I, like I said earlier, 
I came here and quickly realized that Africa is a, is a place to be. And I started encouraging my friends, my mates, to go back. And many, many of them have gone back. Okay. And I know, I know for a fact, there are still a lot of very talented individuals, Africans, who have worked in major corporations at high level who are looking yeah. to, to go back to Africa. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And we, and they're, we do, they're, we do tap into these for diaspora the, flows yeah. as well. They're looking for exactly. the opportunity to go back to Africa. And uh, yeah, you see, we, I know that uh, we in diaspora have a lot of things to contribute to Africa. And the best way to do that is to join the bandwagon, you know, to, yeah. to, to help new companies, new industries, push them with uh, yeah. talent. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You know. So w w what, what are the biggest challenges that you guys face right now? I, I, yeah, I, I would say what, what, what's dominating my mind right now is where will these jobs come from? Hmm. Um, at the end of the day, our business exists to serve the economic growth areas and the career opportunities across the continent. And as, as, as we look at it, um, like I said, just business as usual won't create the number of jobs that we need or the number of people who are going to want jobs. Yeah. So we need to be looking at what, what are the mechanisms to create new jobs? Uh, and I think that, um, um, you know, there, there's opportunities um, where we can start to create jobs by driving more economic development, by, by, by driving more exports of goods and services. And by services, I mean, people who can actually sit here and work for companies overseas. Yeah. Um, there's, 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 of course, opportunities to emigrate, although that's not where we start. We don't work um, anything. But I think what we're trying to find is what are the sectors in the economy that can create, if, if, if suitably developed, can create a lot of jobs, which yeah. I think then drives us very much to um, two, two, two broad areas. Um, um, one is uh, I'm just generally trying to make sure that small and medium enterprises across the continent have the resources they need to optimize their growth and success. Okay. Because at the end of the day, whether you know whatever economy around the world um um you know global south global north etc um smes really drive job creation and jobs yep. in these markets 80 yep. percent plus of jobs would come from them and so finding ways to make sure they're succeeding that they have the tools that they have the financing that they have the people um and so we think a bit about that and then the other is uh you know, there's many others but the other we we think a lot about is is, is a green economy i okay. think we're we're right at the cusp of a, of a of a really significant um um industrial transformation that yeah. will need to happen over the next 30 or 40 years there's already a lot of activity in africa around clean energy both off-grid and on-grid clean energy solutions that are driving yeah. a lot of job creation and, and we do a lot of work there Okay. There's a whole bunch of new companies that are growing around climate tech generally that mm. touch on food systems and how how you know insect protein and and blue economy innovations and regenerative agricultural uh, ag, ag techniques and e-mobility and and electric vehicles and um, there's there's a lot happening uh, um, here that I that I think is very exciting. In the future, the hope is that um, Africa can take advantage of, again, it's different country to country, but generally yeah. speaking, Africa has incredible renewable energy potential yeah. across sun, wind, uh, um, geothermal, et cetera. It has incredible natural resources. So the ability to, to, to bring the production of things like steel and aluminum and things like that closer to the source and okay. do this with a green grid is a really powerful way to make sure the world can keep on running, but you don't have the same uh, carbon emissions. And then of course, and what we focus on is, it, it, it is soon going to have the biggest workforce in the world, yeah. so the biggest population of young people. And, and, and a lot of these are labor intensive industries and opportunities. And so um, yeah. the opportunity to bring those kind of three advantages together and turn what is, is a huge risk uh, the climate catastrophe staring us in the face and turn it into an opportunity for Africa and Africa's youth. Yeah. I think we're excited about.
but yeah, your question started is what's the biggest challenge? The biggest challenge is we, we need more jobs. We need more growth. We need more economic development. The rest yeah. of the, the, everything else we can figure out. I, I'm, I'm not, whether it's, it's not certainly not all us, it's us and, 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 and all of our peer organizations yeah. and, and, and friends and partners, but we need, we need more jobs. Yes, we need more jobs. See, every time I, I think about the, the young population that we have, it scares me, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, it scares me because the number of jobs we need, I don't see them coming through instantly, you know, yep. and uh, like you mentioned, SMEs are the, are the key. Okay. Yes. Big corporations, uh, take only globally only 20 percent of the workforce okay smes yeah. are the th are the key okay so uh um i hope i hope we need to we need to create an engine engine to produce smes <laughs> yep. that's, that's, that's what right we, we need yeah 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 you know? I'm just uh, I'm, and not yeah exactly yeah exactly. You want to stop, say something? No, I was gonna say yeah, pr produce SMEs, but but very critically help more SMEs leap, make cross that chasm into actually employing people. Okay, I think uh, one of the things that happens is we we and it's great. This is the, the right first step. We create a lot of SMEs. There's a lot of micro entrepreneurs, a lot of sole entrepreneurs that are kind of like engaged in livelihood activities. What's so critical for, and that's that's good, but what's really important is for these companies to be able to cross that chasm into having enough revenue, enough business, enough production where they can employ people yeah. and go from, you know, you know, working by themselves or maybe one or two or three employees to a place where they're employing 20, 30, 100 uh, um, people. And I think that's where yeah. things get exciting for the SME sector. Yeah, good, good, good. Now, how do you get into being an entrepreneur you know my, see, my, th this is important if because if hey if you're if you're a young person or how did i do it or both yeah, how, how do you get into the in, into this mode of thinking yeah. about yeah exactly i i i think um entrepreneurship's a mindset and i think we have to start with it as a mindset not as an identity tied to did you start a company okay um and i think uh, most entrepreneurs um, that have started companies probably have a long track record of uh, looking at problems, being very bothered by problems, and just trying to come up with something that fixes those. Um, and I think uh, many of the best entrepreneurs lead with a very deep, intense problem passion. Uh, first and foremost, they, they're obsessed with understanding and trying to tackle some specific issue and that yeah. that could be a, a high social impact issue like solve the climate crisis or something like that but that could also just be like you you worked for several years in in some construction field and it just drives you crazy that there's this inefficiency that like these people don't talk to each other whatever it is yeah um you know logistics i i think uh, um it starts not with these big systems problems or industrial problems but i think as early as possible trying to spot something that could be done better yeah. something that that is a problem and trying to do something about it and we actually teach this uh um, at, in our company um trying to teach everyone to be an entrepreneur um you see something that's inefficient in our company be an entrepreneur try come up with in your idea in your head like well, how might we fix this go try it out and then if it, if it worked great get it going across the company and if it didn't work what's the next thing yeah and i think uh that kind of muscle of like spotting problems coming up with ideas testing them, learning from it, I, I think I think it's entrepreneurship. If you start doing that when you're young and you start doing that on little things, it becomes easier and easier than to apply, I think, that same thing to bigger, more system, systematic problems yeah. where perhaps an actual company can emerge from it. Mm. But I almost mm. think like whether you start a company or not, that should almost be secondary to yeah. just the mindset. Great, great. So now when you're not working on a short list, you double as an angel investor what kind of ventures 
attracts your attention in that space? Yeah, uh, thank you. And I and I I've really enjoyed. I I was an investor, a professional, so to speak, investor before this, running an actual investment fund. And now, of course, I just invest my small savings, so very small checks. I wish I wish I could do more, but <laughs> I think it comes back to just the general passion to channel more resources to companies and founding teams that are pushing the envelope and trying new things. So I get very yeah. excited to to and energized by by hearing what people are working on. I, I invest pretty broadly. I think okay. the extent that I have a, a particular focus, not surprising given that I've, I've been obsessed with this jobs and talent uh, um, um, issue for the last many years. Uh, mostly what I look for are companies that are in this nexus between ed tech and job tech. Okay. Somehow, it doesn't have to be tech forward first or forward, but somehow are using innovation and or technology to make it easier for people to get access to and get prepared for jobs. Um, and so have invested in a number of companies in particular that are trying to build bridges to um, global skills demand pools. So like companies that are training um, salespeople to then okay. be sales development representatives for US companies or companies that are training people to be recruitment sourcers, talent sourcers uh, in Nigeria, but then like doing that, um, getting paid by companies in the US. Um, and so models like that are something I'm interested in. But okay. I also, um, I mean, the beauty of when you're an individual investor is you just invest in things you like. So I'm really looking for ideas and, and areas I don't know much about that I want to learn more about, um, things I wish things I want to exist in the market. Mm, um, mm. Like one investment I made is just in a local beer company. Um, I like their beer. I want to, I want to help them <laughs> out. They don't, they're not accepting donations. I don't know if I would have made a donation, but it was a way of like yeah. um, supporting the ecosystem. Um, and then the last is of course, like founders, uh, I developed some sort of personal connection with. I just want to hear, like support them, hear how they're thinking, learn from, learn from what they're up to. Um, and, and sometimes that leads to um, good outcomes. Sometimes it's a learning opportunity, but yeah. um, I've really enjoyed um, the work we can do uh, and, and with, with other peers that uh, we've been able to do to, to drive more individual money into these early stage companies. Good, good. Now, I, I, I know that uh, many of my young uh, audience would like to know exactly as an investor what are you looking for the the entrepreneur to show you when they want to get an invest investor because yeah. see many, many of question. those young young people don't know exactly what to do you know so yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think I think uh, um, I almost take a step back, and, and and this is not always the case. But more recently, I've been reflecting on the fact that the traditional venture capital model mm. is not well suited to the vast majority of of startups. The vast majority of startups, any in the world, anywhere, anywhere in the world, yeah. but per particularly in Africa, um, I see a lot of companies that are trying to solve problems, and they can be become great businesses, but they're probably not going to be great venture businesses because venture capital is a particular kind of jet fuel that only mm. works in certain kinds of jets. But if you're building a car <laughs> or a scooter or something, you, the jet fuel might blow you up. Yeah. And, and so I think the first question I often am, am asking is, is like, what are you trying to accomplish? What, trying, what kind of business are you trying to build? Um, while some VCs, if you're not trying to build a unicorn, like a business that's a billion dollars plus, yeah. it, they don't, they're not interested. Um, mm -hmm. I do think that the nice thing as an angel investor is there may still be ways to participate and support and make an investment, even if you're not chasing that dream. Um, if you are looking for traditional venture money at the earliest stage, I think what, what an entrepreneur has to convince an investor uh, is that there's a big problem and a big market. Um, so there's this phrase, TAM, total addressable market. You wanna see the fact that um, whatever problem you're solving is a problem for a lot of people that will spend a lot of money on it. Yeah. Or it could be fewer people if they're spending lots and lots of money. Like obviously like something like 
like what space i mean making this up what spacex serves yep. mm -hmm. the, the actual yeah. number of customers for what they do yeah. it's not that many it's like governments and whatever but the governments are willing to spend so much money on it yeah their market size is huge so you want us to show a big market you want to show that you ideally have a, a a solution that is working that's the best or is believable and plausible that it would work to solve it and is something that's defensible. It's not something that the second you get it working, someone's gonna copy it. Um, mm. And then it comes down to like talent. Like does this founder or founding team or, or the team behind it, do they actually seem like they have the skills, the experience, the, the, the energy to make this, make this happen? Yeah. Um, and I think like in the earliest stages, if you can get market to work with defensible solution, to work with a strong team, um, that's a great, great start. And that's what you want to almost uh, uh, hone in as, as much as possible. Great. Really pitches. Great. See, from what you said, there's something that many young people who are looking for investors, they, they want investors at the beginning when their solution has not been tested. Okay. I've told, I, I usually tell them, hey, first, make a model. Doesn't matter how small it is, test it, okay? If it works, then you're looking for invest investment to rev it up. Well, yep. you, are, you are, are, are an investor. Please tell my, my audience exactly what happens in this space. What, what, wait, as, as you're raising money and as you're starting to grow? Yeah, now I mean, tell them, would they get investors at the beginning when their solutions has not been tested, or would they get investors when their solutions shows yeah. promise? There's no question. It is far better to wait until your solution shows promise. And what I'm often advising entrepreneurs is to try to bootstrap as long as possible. Bootstrapping simply means like don't take outside money. Yeah. figure out a way to, 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 to earn enough revenue or use your savings or use credit cards, very dangerous and, and <laughs> less, 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 less of those here than in the U S. Um, um, I, but I think, I think that, uh, um, um, there's a tendency, I think popularized it in like, like startup accelerators and things like that to come up with an idea, make a pitch deck and go try to get money. And I actually um, think that occasionally that works for entrepreneurs, but generally your best, your best bet is to focus on the problem, work on building something, work on getting paid and making the ends meet for as long as possible to get as many proof points, de-risk your business as much as possible. And then only, only ever go try to raise money if you're really confident you've got something that works, that you know that, that, the, the, that you know exactly how um, bringing in money will not just let you stay alive longer, but genuinely serve your ability to invest in growth and success. Yeah. Only then do you bring money. Um, now, look, mo most founders don't do that because there's a reality, which is like building a company does cost money. But, yeah. And most people don't have lots and lots of cash lying around to to do things. So I'm, I'm very mindful of the risks. But I also tell people, um, there, there, there may be other ways to raise money that aren't going to investors. Um, there's ways where um, you can, you can uh, essentially get paid to build a solution or build a product for a particular customer along the way. So rather than you investing in building the, the, the product, you go to, I don't know, Equity Bank or Safaricom or something, and, and they want something built and you, you actually, you know, they you build pay it for them. you almost pay you to build it. And then you take the, the thing and you figure out how to turn yeah. it into a business. There's ways where you can use consulting resources. So you actually go out and cons you, you offer up your uh, advisory services and time and energy to go consult, get paid to, in a way that you're also learning, but then you can put the money back into the business. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also very lean ways to build a business that don't go to immediately a lot of fixed costs and a lot of burn. Uh, so I think there's uh, a lot of opportunity to um, um, think about like short-term consultants and specialists in particular areas, rather than let's say hiring a full-time marketing person or designer or software engineer. Uh, there's a lot more options available. Um, so I, I, I like that you asked that. And I think that, you know, staying, staying away from money as long as possible is uh, what I generally rec recommend. 
good. Now you mentioned something. De-risk. Okay. What does it mean to do to de-risk the business before you go out there to start asking people to invest? Yeah, I think I think the the the, the process, even as an investor, the process yeah. you often follow is you look at the business and you try to identify what's the most likely reason this thing won't work. Um, and most of us are pretty good at that. Uh, most of us yeah. are great at being pessimists and figuring out reasons won't, <laughs> things won't work. Um, if, if, if it's challenging to come up with, I think one of the, I, I like the idea of, of imagining like what the postmortem will read or what the, what the eulogy will, or, or the, uh, the obituary will okay. in the future. <laughs> like you almost put yourself like if in, if in five years, this doesn't work and somebody is writing the story on why this didn't work, what are they going to yeah. say? Mm -hmm. um, once you, once you know those reasons, like, and oftentimes in the early stage, the reasons are like, like it's impossible to build. Okay. okay. Well, yeah, if it's impossible to build, then this isn't going to work out. So let's prove it by building it. Um, Good. People don't want it. Um, okay. Well, I can, I can kind of address that by, sh by showing that people want it. They use it. They come back. They give me good reviews, whatever. Good. Um, the unit economics won't, will never work. Meaning we can build it. We can send it out there, but it's always going to cost us more to produce than someone mm. will pay us for it. Well, great. Get some proof points. Get, get people paid. See how Good. much they'll pay. Whatever, and you kind of just go down the list of these different things, and the more of these you can check off, the stronger your investment proposition is. Very good. Um, some of them are very concrete, and you can solve them. Some of them are more fuzzy and conceptual, maybe like competitive dynamics. There's there may there may not be no easy way to prove that competitors won't come in and try to beat you, but um, you can try to get a different proxy. So yeah, I think it, it is trying to just like anticipate those issues. Move, move down the list um, very good and, and prove as many of them wrong as possible very good very good see my audience will be especially the young ones they will be happy for this few minutes were spent trying to address some of the major issues when it comes to getting money and investors thank you thank you for that see i i love reading okay so you can see around me books 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 you can't see my room me but too. if you could, if you, could see, yep. if you could see my room you'd be sure mm -hmm. <laughs> have books everywhere now i love yep. reading okay and i believe that education is the number one key for africa's development okay and unfortunately unfortunately right now currently we don't read a lot okay so one of the things i do here is to encourage my audience to read right and i ask you Great. my guest my guest please recommend five books to my audience Great question um, and a tough one. I, I love reading. Um, I read probably 60, 70 plus books a year and it's really Ooh. the way I, um, I just enjoy it so much. Um, and I know not everyone loves, loves reading. It can be tedious, et cetera, but I, I think it's great. And it's one of the lowest cost, highest return activities you can engage in. Exactly. Um, that, that really you know, there's so many free books available uh, um, in different in different channels. Kindles Kindles become a lot cheaper, so yeah, I love it. Um, I probably I'd, I'd come up with a few. I think I think most of these I've, I've read in the last uh, year. I don't know if I'll five, but I'll come up with a few I've really okay. liked. Um, what one one is um, I'm trying to think of uh, if if I was to recommend a single climate book. I think it's very important that, uh, as, given what we discussed, that, that uh, people know about um, what's going on in the global okay. climate issue. What is this climate crisis? Why does everyone talk about it all the time? Uh, what are the fundamentals? I think, I think one, one easy, to, easy to start place that's also very, very good is the book that Bill Gates wrote. It's called okay. um, how, to, how to Avert a Climate Disaster. Oh, okay. um, and I think what it does is it just does a very no nonsense walkthrough of what 
what does the global carbon emissions look like? Where does it come from? What are some of the innovations that are happening that might be able to limit some of this? What are some of the consequences? What are, how do those consequences differ but depending on where you live? I think the reality is currently Africa is a minuscule part of global emissions. Yeah. Two and a half, three, three percent, but but stands to unfortunately bear the brunt of a lot of the worst consequences in terms yeah. of agriculture and coast coastal issues and things like that. So I think this is an important book to 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 to, to think about. Okay. Um, this is a funny book title, but one of the books I found myself thinking about the most is uh, in the last year or two has been "The End of the World is Just the Beginning." Um, I think the author's name is Peter Zehan. It's something yep. with a Z. I have you right um, there. I've read it. Oh. Oh, yeah. I, 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 I don't know what you thought, but I, I, <laughs> oh, I the way, the I way love you it. knit de demography, geography, yep. economy, I, I love uh, it. trade. Yeah. Okay. So I, I think that's a, that's a great <laughs> one. So please uh, get everyone to read that one. It, yeah. It's kind of a, it's, it's a bigger book and it presents this kind of like a big one, but it's actually very readable and fun. Yeah, it I is. It is. It enjoyed is. It. Yeah. So yeah. I love, love that book. Um, I love it. Yeah. Cobalt Red is a book I just read in the last couple, few weeks that I, okay. yeah, I just Co found Cobalt it shocking. Red. Cobalt Red, I, I'm blanking on the author's name, um, but um, essentially talking about the incredibly sad and 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 terrible cobalt mining industry ah, in the DRC. Oh, yeah. Okay. I think um, I was I just written in the I've last year. I've listened to him. I've listened to him on 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 a podcast. Uh, I I I actually think he was a guest of Joe Rogan's experience. Probably. Recently. Yeah, he probably yeah, was. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I just found, I mean, I, I, I had no real knowledge of the extent to which cobalt is a necessary rare earth uh, material, mineral in everything we depend on, all mm. of our phones, all of our electronics, the EV re revolution, and how terrible uh, it, yeah, the mining, mining industry is yeah, around the it. The mining is crazy. Um, and so... I think it's really important for the world to kind of know about that, be aware of that. Yep. Um, so that was a good one. Um, a couple of then different ones. Um, a book that jumps to mind is a book called uh, Culture Map. I, I'm blanking on the author's mm. name. Cold, it Culture be Aaron, Map. Aaron okay. Meyer. Yeah, it might be Aaron Meyer. Um, um, no, but don't worry, I'll, I'll, I'll check it, it out. I'll check it out, yeah. So mm -hmm. Culture Map is a uh, um, uh, g gives a sense uh, along different dimensions how different cultures can be, particularly for business context, but really around the world. And okay. I think we've used that we have a team, we have team that, uh, that uh, from many different nationalities, not only across Africa, but we also have a, uh, a 15 person team in India. We have, we have teammates who are, are European, uh, yeah. Canadian, American, uh, Filipino, and um, realize, I think this book does a great job of helping you understand some systematic ways that different cultures might see the same situation or mm. the same input and just experience it differently. Different. And I know as me, I, I'm, <laughs> you know, there's, there's ways in which, you know, I can't help. I'm, I was raised in America. There's certain deeply coded scripts and mm. programs running in there. Um, and it's great to bring up those blind spots we all might mm. have okay. as we're like, Okay. Um, yeah, trying to seek to good. understand each other better. The last one I'd say is is, is uh, World Religions by Houston Smith. It's very mm. old. It's probably 60 or 70 years old. Mm. But at this moment where we have so many um, um, sharp divergences, I think trying to understand some of these belief systems. Yeah. Um, and I think what this book does a great job of just helping you in no nonsense, but also in their best possible reading understand what do the what are these religions about what mm. are they in their best their best sense people who yeah. really believe in them what 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 is compelling what do people get out of these yeah i found it i've read it a few times over the course of my life um and i wow. found it useful interesting so i'll stop there i don't know if that was four or five but um yeah five um, i five. can keep going yeah, you, i love you, you love give, give enough five that's good world religion that, the last one yeah oh good good yeah. good thank you thank you for that okay see uh i know we have talked a lot uh, on issues that will help young Africans. But I want you to do more, okay? Advise young Africans. What can they do to help them contribute a little bit in yeah. their communities? Yeah, there's that phrase, um, um, think globally, act locally. But I would say, okay. think locally. <laughs> 
act locally. Okay. Um, okay. Think, uh, um, in the in the in the early days, uh, particularly if 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 there's folks listening or that you're coaching that are uh, have aspirations to solve big problems, there's this tendency to kind of like think big from day one. But if you think too big, you get lost in the world of academics and policymakers, mm. and you don't ever actually get anything done. So I think the key is often find something really specific, find a problem that matters to you that you yeah. that you want to address, and then just do something. Very and then good. I mean, startups, entrepreneurship, et cetera, it is just doing things. It's not thinking things, it's not strategy. Of course, at points you have to make sure you're overlaying a strategy and that sort of things. But in the early days, as you're getting there, it's just about doing. It's about finding mm -hmm. something, start something. Did that work? What was the feedback on that? Okay, we'll do it a little bit different next time. Okay, what was the feedback? So the more people can just kind of get out there and, and uh, try things, the better. Very, see, very simple and very, very valuable. Yeah, good. You are an American, okay? But uh, like you just told us, you have uh, done most of your work in the last 15 years outside of America, okay? With developing countries, India, now Africa, right? So what is your vision for Africa in particular in the next uh, 20, 30 years? Great question. I'm I'm very mindful uh, and very sincerely that I should not be the one, obviously setting setting a vision for Africa. I think no, I've been lucky you're, that you're, I've been you're setting your, to, your own vision. My own vision. Own vision. Yeah, because yes. yeah, I think yep. I feel I yeah. feel fortunate that I've been able to come into um, uh, markets uh, that aren't necessarily my 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 home and try to work on different problems. Um, my 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 hope is that we can take these assets that that Africa has and 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 develop them into uh, making Africa essentially the the and like the home of industry and talent for the world. Um, the demographics, the resources, the energy potential are all pulling in our favor over here. Um, I think that the, the, there are many risks um, around politics and divisions and, and the cross-border challenges and, and, and many of the ways in which African economies are squeezed by the global economic system and interest rates and currencies. And there's a lot of challenges and you don't yeah. need me to, to tell you, but um, the, 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 the opportunity that and green economy is just one example, but I think you can look at um, arts and entertainment and athletics and 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 um, um, cultural influences and so many different things. But just within the green economy, um, the the ch my my hope would be that in twenty or thirty years, so much of the world's industry and production and manufacturing has shifted here. Okay. Um, we have reduced the global carbon footprint by taking. Okay you know, energy intensive industries from other markets and uh, um, that where it's all carbon emissions because it's all coal powered and shifting them here where it can be renewable. We don't have to shift things around the world as much. We, 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 we can use green grids um, and really turn that into an opportunity that creates more local wealth rather than just shipping everything off uh, as low end commodities um, mm -hmm. and creates a lot more local uh, jobs. And I think with that kind of wealth, so many other things become possible. Um, it becomes so much more possible to invest in vibrant um, education ecosystems, arts, entertainment, literature, like uh, movies, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah. the, uh, and, and I think there's no question that the, the world and economies favor youth and yeah. Africa has more youth than anyone else. So I get, mm. I get very excited about what the next uh, several decades could look like uh, if, if, if a few things turn in our favor. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's very true. Uh, see, Paul, this short one hour, okay, has been very, very useful to me, my audience. And uh, I wish you the best with shortlist. See, the Thank you. work you guys are doing is uh, it's essential for Africa and the world, you know. And uh, yeah, yeah, I would uh, see one very, very soon, maybe next year or the year after, I will be in Kenya. I'm sure I'm, I'll be in Kenya. I look forward to seeing and you. And I would, uh, I would 
call you and say, hey, Paul, where are you? You know, I would like yeah. to meet him. All right. Thank you very that. much for being a great guest of the Think Big for Africa podcast. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Have a great weekend. You too. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.